fire, and ever-present danger in our community. Welcome to Truckee Talks. I'm Maya Schneider, your host for the show. Today's show will be on fire safety, prevention of fire inside the home, maintaining a defensible space around your home, and safe fire practices in our forested areas. Before we go to our guests for the day, I'd like to introduce an interview that we taped earlier. Susan and Michael Dorwart are local Truckee residents who lost their home in the Oakland Hills fire a few years ago. I'd like to share this with you as an emphasis and a reminder that anybody can lose their home at any time. Susan, thank you for joining me here today. You and your family experienced the loss of your home in the Oakland firestorm a few years ago, and I'd like you to share that experience with the audience if you would. Just tell us a little bit about the experience. First of all, were you home when it happened? Uh, no, we were camping with some friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, we drove home and found out about it by listening to the radio. And then I called a friend to find out if I could go home, and she said, no, you can't. So we went to stay with some friends and kind of waited until we found out, you know, what the outcome was. What was your immediate reaction when you found out the fire was going, but you didn't know what the status of your home was? Uh, about as much anxiety as anyone could, um, you know, handle. Mm -hmm. um, I was worried um, because I had pets at home and I didn't know if they got out and uh, you know it was just you know totally shocked. We were in shock a long time. And when you did actually find out about your home being destroyed this is I know hard for you. Mm -hmm. What what was your initial reaction to that? How did you feel? I think we knew that the house um, was gone mm -hmm. and uh, it was pretty devastating you know, to know that everything you owned was no longer in existence. And after a few days, we found out um, one of the cats returned, and then about 11 days later. So basically that's, you know, what held me together in the beginning, just knowing our... The return really of the cats. Right. Um, uh, our core group w was still there. Great. So. That's good. That's something good came out of something pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Susan, a lot of people feel that something like that can never happen to them. Um, for some reason we just kind of go on through our day-to-day -day existence believing that our homes are safe from fire. How much of a shock was this to you and what do you have to say to those people who think it can never happen to them? Um, I think anybody living in California probably could experience this kind of fire. I, uh, we lived in the Oakland Hills and um, I look around in Contra Costa County and Marin County um, parts of Southern California, it's pretty much a firebox anywhere you look. And ready to go. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. What we'll be talking about on today's show is fire protection in the Truckee area. I think it's very important that you came and shared your thoughts and your experience with us. As brief as it was, I appreciate you sharing this very personal experience with <laughs> us. Thank yeah. you for coming on the show. Thank you. I'd like to thank Susan Dorwart and the Dorwart family for sharing that experience with us. I'm sure that was a difficult task for her. With me today for our show are Laura Mello, local landscape architect, and Harry Chapel from the Truckee Fire Protection District. Before we get started on our conversation, I'd also like to remind our viewers that as a special feature, we will be running a, t a videotape at the end of our presentation, which is from the California Department of Forestry, and will specify some measures that you can take for fire safety around the home. Carrie, let's start with you. I know that there are some specific things that you wanted to talk about today about fire safety around the house. So let's talk about the exterior of the home first. Okay, I guess uh, the most important thing that we can stress here is what we call defensible space, meaning that uh, we'd like to have the vegetation uh, cleared away from the structure to prevent a fire from having fuel to burn into the structure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the laws require a 30-foot clearance around the structure or to the property line whichever is closer, uh, which you can't go on somebody else's property and, and clean up. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the most important thing that's going to probably le let your house survive a wildland fire if it's coming into it okay. uh, from the outside. So it means cleaning up and pruning up and general cleaning. I guess one of the most vulnerable parts of a house burning down like Susan went through down in Oakland was the, the, uh, the spotting that takes place on a fire and lands on the roof. So a roof is a very important part of the uh, 
of the house to get rid of the pine needles and, and the uh, leaves and stuff that accumulate on your roof and in the gutters and things like that. You need to get up there and, and clean them off and, uh, and that will uh, help uh, prevent a fire from starting on the roof. Okay. I think another thing that we need to stress here is that most people think that they have to clean up around their property and clean it down to bare dirt. That's really not the case. We need to have uh, the properties clean so it's still aesthetically pleasing and yet still be fire safe. And uh, maybe she can talk a little about uh, the landscape that we recommend uh, to make your properties fire safe. Okay, Laura, that goes right to you then. Yeah. Um, basically, what we're trying to do is uh, close into the structure, we want to keep low fuel volume plants. So we're talking lawns or there are types of ice plant that grow up in the Sierras. There's also um, creeping ground covers and herbs that are very fire resistant. Also, if you have an irrigated landscape, that also helps cutting down on the fuel volume. It's the larger shrubs mm -hmm. that you want to keep out away from your house, maybe to the perimeter of your property. Mm -hmm. And if you can also irrigate those, that's all the better. But uh, really the closer in the better to keep the irrigation. Okay good and what about types of trees? I know that some trees are more susceptible to f uh, flame than others. Some catch fire quicker than others and I'll ask both of you about that. Laura you first. Are mm -hmm. there specific kinds of trees which may be indigenous or native to the area which are better than others? Well actually uh, the pine trees have a lot of uh, sap and liquid that's fire hazardous mm -hmm. you know it does bring in a, a potential hazard uh, if you can keep those trimmed back away from your roof then you can cut back on the potential danger of that um, as far as low volume low fire hazard type plants we're usually talking about shrubs and and ground cover uh, there aren't any trees that are indigenous to this area that are specifically fire retardant no magic fire right trees right okay all right Harry, I know another thing that you wanted to talk about was spacing, and why is the spacing of trees and shrubbery so critical around the home? Well, what we look at there is, is uh, when, you, when you space the fuel type, it, it eliminates the fire from jumping from bush to bush or tree to tree. So if we uh, can space those trees, uh, those shrubs, uh, approximately three times the height of the fuel type itself, mm -hmm. then the fire can't go from bush to bush to bush. It has to go down on the ground. When it goes down on the ground, that's when we will pick up the fire. Uh, one other thing I'd like to add about the trees here is a lot of the trees around this area here, especially the, the, the native trees, mm -hmm. the crowns on these trees go all the way to the ground. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is have them pruned up so you can mm -hmm. at least walk under them so it doesn't give that fire that's on the surface uh, a ladder for it to climb up into the top of the tree. I understand. Okay. What types of fires, how, how are these fires started? Let me start that way. What kinds of combustion creates the fires that we're talking about here? Are they external sources? Are they man-made causes? Well, you know, there's a lot of things that start fires. In this particular area here, one of the biggest causes of fires uh, that uh, at least in the last few years uh, has been lightning. Lightning causes fire all the time around here. So that's mm -hmm. something you can't predict and you can't pre uh, really uh, prevent it. So uh, that's something we have to live with and it does hit in, into the wildlands where people live. But there's other sources of ignition, campfires, uh, uh, debris burning. There's a lot of things that cause it, different fires. Okay. Ordinances against removing trees from a privately owned lot. Does somebody have to get a permit or a license to remove trees or shrubbery? There are some subdivisions that require uh, permits to have trees removal, uh, and they have CCNRs and things like that. Uh, but if the tree's dead, uh, most of the homeowners associations are, are letting those trees be removed. After all, you know, we had a lot of uh, bugs in this area here. Like, mm -hmm. like what happened at Donner Lake, if you look at that down there now, that, you know, that's destroyed, Lake Tahoe and so forth. So you need to get those trees out of there because they are a fire hazard as well as uh, a breeding area for, for the beetles and so forth. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. On the reverse side of that then, are there mandates to remove dead trees or, or excess shrubbery from lots or from homes? Uh, we as a fire department and our ordinances can re have you remove them and we would give you 30 days to remove the tree. Uh, just generally, uh, if, if it's not a, a fire problem or something like that, I don't know of any homeowners that say you have to move it uh, within a certain length of time. They will, although, uh, require it, but they don't necessarily give you a, a deadline like a week or something mm -hmm. like that. We probably are more constrained on that than anybody. 
And what kind of enforcement tools do you have? Well, we have inspectors out there now uh, mm -hmm. in the Truckee area. We're running eight inspectors doing these defensible space inspections on the properties in Truckee right now, mm -hmm. and they're out there. Uh, they've done over 2,000 of them as of this date in the last five weeks, so they're out there and they're, they're going to come back and, and we're going to get compliance and that's the only way we're going to make the community fire safe if everybody does their job. And pitches in. That's right. Right. Okay. That's always a problem with when in subdivision areas where your neighbor's very close and you've taken the time to make your defensible space and irrigate your lawn and all this and then your neighbors are part-time homeowners or hardly ever there or it's a vacant lot. Vacant lots are a big problem. So the enforcement really comes in as a mm -hmm. critical measure here to mm -hmm. making sure that everybody does pitch in. Mm -hmm. Laura, we're wrapping up this segment of the show, but I wanted to ask you briefly, uh, for our homeowners that don't have 30 feet setbacks mm -hmm. and they may only have 10 feet between themselves and the next roof over or the next lot line, how can they still manage to have some greenery around and keep their homes fire safe? I think the ideal thing is to uh, irrigate the area then also uh, keep it well maintained, keep the dead brush out of there and keep the uh, weeds and grasses that are growing in underneath the shrubs mm -hmm. cleared out. Mm -hmm. um, also to pick plants that are somewhat fire retardant, which uh, the fire department has a list and there are books available with lists of plants. Okay, good. So we mm -hmm. can encourage people to go to the library, go to the fire department, mm -hmm. go to a local landscape architect right. and <laughs> get the information. Okay. Terry, we'll be keeping you on for the second half okay. of the program, so we'll be able to talk some more with you about uh, home protection and, and, and safety around the home. But I did also want to ask you about older homes now that have the existing older shake roofs or wood siding. These may be homes that are 30 years old or so and fire protection measures that new homes have. What can homeowners do aside from a total remodel of their home that will assist in keeping those types of homes more safe? Well, I, I notice uh, there are some homes in the, in the truck here that people actually have gone out and taken the wood shake roof off their house and replaced it with a, with a metal or a tile roof. Uh, I don't think everybody's going to do that, but I have noticed some of that. But I, I guess if you have a wood shake roof on your house, the, uh, the most important thing is, like I'm saying, let's just keep the needles off of it and let's keep the uh, vegetation around your house so the fire does come, it, you know, hopefully it doesn't get up on there. Right now, if you've got a, a roof, like I say, a wood shake roof is it's not a very fire safe thing and as a matter of fact they're outlawed in Nevada County so you couldn't put one on any new construction now so we're not going to have we're not creating more backlog problems for the roofs. Right. Okay well that's interesting so the ma the ordinances are already changing and we're already seeing a change over to types of structures which are more fire resistant. Have you found in your experience that that's a help to you that the newer structures are indeed safer or at least more fire resistant than some of the older homes? Well I believe so yeah I think with the type of uh, material they're using on houses today and the roofing like I say that that's the main thing most of the houses in the Truckee area here now are go with a metal roof you know it, it's a fire resistant mm -hmm. roof plus the snow slides off it so you know, that is really a, a much better roof than wood shake. Easier to maintain all the way around. That's right. And I, I believe that in Oakland, California, and they had the fire, that what you'd find very few metal roofs down there, but you'd find a lot of wood shake roofs. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that wraps up this segment of the show. Harry, we'll see you come back for the second half. Mm -hmm. Laura Mello, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your expertise with us. Well, thank you for having us. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Welcome back to the second half of Truckee Talks. We're talking about fire safety and fire prevention, and for the second half of the show, I'd like to welcome back Harry Chapel from Truckee Fire Protection District. We also have Kathy Murphy from the United States Forestry Service and Bryce Keller from the California Department of Forestry. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. coming on the show. Kathy, I want to start with you. What are some of the common causes that you see in forest fires? Are they man-made or natural? Well, in the Truckee area, human-caused fires have increased by over 40 percent in the last 10 years. We have all variety of causes. We have equipment, smoking, children with matches, and our number one cause in this area is escape campfires. Can you talk about that? What, what do people need to be doing to contain campfires? Are people just walking away from live fires? or? The first thing um, you need if you're outside a developed campground is a campfire permit, and those can be obtained 
at any Forest Service or CDF station throughout the state of California. Mm -hmm. They're good throughout the state. Here, I'll show you what type of material that needs to be cleared from a campfire. You have pine needles, which are flammable and will burn. Mm -hmm. Those need to be cleared a minimum of five feet. Around the perimeter of the campfire. That's right. Okay. There's organic material, otherwise known as duff, and that also burns. That also needs to be cleared until you get all the way down to mineral soil. So basically you need to see dirt. That's correct. Around your campfire. That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what about using combustible materials to start your campfire? Is, is it okay? Is it a good idea or a bad idea to be using things like kerosene or lighter fluid or does that make a difference? Well, the best thing is to just use some newspaper and kindling that you can usually find right around the campfire area. Okay. And then you want to make sure when you put your campfire out that you drown it, that you stir it up with a shovel, and then you feel to make sure that it's cool because that's uh, oftentimes a mistake that people make is they just pour water on it and they think it's out and they leave it and it's really not out unless you can stir it and feel it and there's no heat. So if you can't touch it with your hands it's too hot to walk away from That's yet. That's correct. Okay, all right. And you, you spoke of a 40 percent increase and that included equipment. I'm curious about what that is. Do you mean construction equipment or? It could be uh, clearing equipment, road uh -huh. clearing equipment mm -hmm. or um, brush clearing equipment, chainsaws that don't have spark arresters, mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. All right. Okay. And what about other causes of fire? Do you see other causes besides campfires? Are there natural causes such as lightning? We have about half of our fires are lightning mm -hmm. and about half of them are, are human caused. Okay. And the ratio of human and lightning is continue to rise on the human Increase side. Increase on the human side. So we really need to practice more awareness when we're out in our forested areas. That's correct. And be more careful. Okay. Bryce, I'll turn over to you now for a minute. Um, what activities does the CDF engage in from a fire prevention standpoint? What kind of actions do you take? CDF has um, several activities that we embark on during the course of the year to uh, aid ourselves in fire prevention. We do that in cooperation with our cooperators. And one of the biggest things, as uh, Harry addressed with the Fire Protection District, is a fire safe program with inspectors out in the community. In fact, um, we have uh, an inspector in the Truckee area currently in cooperation with Truckee that are doing those joint inspections. Again, the fire safe, mm -hmm. making sure that there's fuel reduction, a minimum amount of clearance around the residence, and so that's an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, um, we do uh, permit processes for burning, and during the springtime of the year, as part of that cleanup of the dooryard, uh, one of the ways to do that is burning, and but it needs to be done under permit, uh, and those can be obtained from the local fire district or the CDF facilities and or the service, uh, and it's an interagency permit form, and that gives us a chance to educate the public on how to do burning properly, and then uh, as well as we know where those burns are taking place. Okay, so knowing ahead of time that that's not necessarily a problem fire, that that may be a permitted fire. Right. Okay. Th th there's one other thing that we do is we only allow that burning for a certain time of the year. Mm -hmm. And currently, we plan to suspend burning July 1. Mm -hmm. An example of that is, uh, historically, we have many fires that are caused in the community from escape debris burning. and we just can't afford to have that happen in mm -hmm. the community in which we live mm -hmm. um, during the peak of our fire season. Right. So we still uh, reach a balance of allowing the community to get the cleanup work done in a safe fashion and yet suspend it during the critical period and that's uh, tenderly July 1st of this year. And that's a time when your resources are stretched pretty thin anyway, you're responding to other fires and... Potentially, yes. Okay. Right. Uh, well, it seems to me that 96 was, or has been, a, an especially weird a season weather-wise. We had the late winter, and then it was wet for a long time, which encourages some of the undergrowth. And now it's been hot and dry, and it's been lovely weather to be out playing in, but it seems to me that it's, it's kind of a match waiting to be lit. Can you talk about that a little bit? Is this year any different than other years? Um, you, you're right. We've had some warm weather here recently, mm -hmm. which has uh, certainly dried some things out. And, uh, uh, in fact, that is... Uh, spawned a potential early burn ban in the Tahoe Basin, not to be confused with here, mm -hmm. uh, for their conditions. But uh, I would characterize that any 
a fire season has the potential to be bad if the elements of Mother Nature want to come together at any given time. Uh, it certainly has the potential um, to be catastrophic for the community, and it just depends on if those elements are going to come together. Wind, temperature, and then an ignition source to cause us the problem. And that's a good point. We really have to practice diligence all the time. It's, it's not something we can think about this year and forget about next year. It's an ongoing Correct. eye to that. Kathy, let me throw this back at you. What <coughs> kinds of activities is the uh, Forest Service engaged in to mitigate or prevent fo forest fires? We do uh, various things to help reduce fire hazard in the forest. Uh, one example would be areas of dense trees, such as out in the Sawtooth area behind mm -hmm. Ponderosa Palisades and mm -hmm. Martis Woods. We constructed a fuel break there by thinning out some of the ladder fuels that Harry talked about earlier, the, the younger trees that carry a fire from the forest floor into the crowns. And we thin those using a machine called a feller buncher, clips off the whole tree and puts it in a bundle and takes it to a landing. And the whole tree is utilized, the tree, the branches, everything. So the end result is a clean forest floor, mm. um, not much more there than what was there when it started. Another thing that we do uh, as a follow-up to that, and um, also in the Sawtooth area, similar work um, adjacent to Tahoe Donner, and we have some coming up adjacent to Russell Valley, we do what's called prescribed burning, where we go out and we deliberately set fires under controlled conditions that will clear out some of the excess uh, vegetation, pine needles, some of the duff. So when the major fire comes through, it hits that area, it's already been burned and it's eliminated a lot of the fuels that would have burned in a wildfire. Now when we talk about controlled burns, with there being, it seems to me, more and more vegetation underground, with, with we're not, Mother Nature isn't allowed to come through and do her own fires, understandably so, but now we have much more growth or much more brush on the ground. How hard is it to, to control these controlled burns? Is it, is it a difficult task to really keep them in check? Well, we do it under, you know, very controlled conditions. Mm -hmm. So we have pre-established boundaries, mm -hmm. we have trained personnel uh, with the Forest Service, and we also get cooperation from Truckee Fire and CDF mm -hmm. in implementing these burns. So. Uh, it, it does take something to pull them off, but we're well prepared to do that. Okay. You mentioned something, and you talked about cooperation, and Bryce, you mentioned that as well. Harry, can you discuss that? What kind of cooperative activities you're engaged with the other agencies? <coughs> yeah, I think uh, something that we ought to all remind ourselves of here, this is a big task what we're talking about here, from the homeowner himself or mm -hmm. herself is protecting our property out to the, uh, the federal agencies and the state agencies that are fight these fires all the mm -hmm. time. So you might say what, what Kathy was just talking about then from the federal standpoint on national forests, they have some investment out there and they don't want wildland fires coming from subdivisions running out and burning up forests down and we don't want them coming from the forest in the subdivision. So you can see what her, she was talking about in her shaded fuel breaks, actually what the, the Smoky Bear might be doing is he's doing defensible space out there in the forest. Mm -hmm. She talked about the low intensity burn and removing the ladder fuels and things. Same thing that the property owners are doing around their structures. But uh, we've had great, great cooperation here with the uh, three agencies mm -hmm. here at the table. Mm -hmm. We all work together. We have a common goal of uh, uh, preventing fires uh, in, the, in the subdivisions as well as the forest. And I think, on the other hand, too, uh, the homeowners associations have been very cooperative in working with us here. Tao Donner uh, was one of the first ones that started off here locally, and uh, they are doing fuel breaks up there, uh, uh, control burning, they have tree removal, they have fuel wood programs, uh, they uh, chip the fuel that you take around your house and put it out in the street, they chip it and haul it away. So this is a big community effort. and. Um, it even boils down to the schools. This year we uh, went in there and uh, worked with over 1,400 students uh, on defensible space and uh, kids uh, drew the posters that we have around town uh, that you'll see out there. There's eight of them in the community and it was based on defensible space or how they thought work in their community. Mm -hmm. So from the grammar schools, kindergartens, all the way up to homeowners association and federal and uh, state agencies and local agencies, this is a win-win situation, uh, but it takes everybody's effort 
to make this community fire safe and um, we'll all be winners if, uh, if that's what happens. We don't want to have an Oakland Hills or a, or a grass fire, a 49er fire right. in this area. And last year or two years ago when we had the fires here east of us, uh, at uh, Verdi and Cottonwood mm -hmm. and, and Hurstdale, those fires uh, ran off and uh, threatened communities. Uh, if the fires would have started over here at Donner Lake, we'd be talking about Truckee, California rather than in uh, Oakland or uh, Verdi or someplace like that. So we have the potential here. We have very extreme fire weather here on the eastern side of the Sierras. Mm -hmm. You look around the community and you look up on the hills and see where there's no trees growing anymore. And those are brush fields there. Well, those were, were, were fires from the past. At one time, there was trees, there was and forest in that area. A question was asked about the Donna Ridge fire earlier today and uh, it started 36 years ago. It come off of the Interstate 80 freeway when they were doing construction work there, burned for 46,000 acres <coughs> all the way into Nevada, and it burned right through the heart of Tower of Honor. Yeah. Certainly the potential is there for some very tragic right. circumstances and we want to avoid that. Right. I'm afraid that we're running right out of time here, but I really want to thank all three of you for coming on the show. Um, Harry, you stuck it out for the first right. and second half and I appreciate that. Okay. Bryce and Kathy, thank you both. And it's encouraging to me to see that there is so much cooperation interagency. And I'd like to remind our viewers as well that we have a responsibility to make sure that our homes are fire safe and that we're being safe when we're out in the forested area. So thank you for those reminders. There's a few other reminders that I have to give to my viewers. Uh, one is that we're always looking for input for future shows. We will be showing our telephone number and our mailing address at the end of this show, so please feel free to give us some feedback. Also, there is a video coming up at the end of this presentation, which is provided by the California Department of Forestry, that really gives some very specific information on things that you can do to maintain your home in a fire-safe manner and what to do in case a fire breaks out. I encourage you to stay tuned and watch that. Again, thank you to my guests. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank See you. you next time on Trekkie Talks.